All right. Um, look, good evening, everyone. And I'm going to start off with a couple of housekeeping things. If you're logging in, as I can see, there's a, a few people that have logged in tonight for this live. Could you please mute your microphones? And uh, otherwise, we'll, we're going to get a lot of white noise. But um, uh, that bit of housekeeping uh, aside, I want to uh, welcome everybody. And for the first time, we're uh, there's a whole bunch of you down in the Rock Castle room here at SPP, which I was just down in. And, uh, and, um, and so welcome. We, we really just had this thought today that we wanted to, uh, you know, once a month we share webinars here and and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to, 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 to the community that's in-house at the moment, be able to, to have you online. So it does feel a bit odd to be upstairs uh, talking to a screen when I know a lot of you are down there, um, but, but welcome. And welcome to you guys that have tuned in either live now or that are listening to this webinar from our website. Um, I think it's a great resource that uh, SPP has decided to provide information on how we would deal with things and tonight we're looking at mastering moods and and it'll be uh, the S SPP's take on looking at how we will look at depression and anxiety as a secondary symptom of the developmental immaturity model. I got a lot of slides when I was putting this thing together. I was um, uh, probably inspired by a couple of things. Firstly, um, Pia Melody's um, Pia Melody's model of uh, developmental maturity is, is something that uh, is at the heart of my own recovery and, and uh, which makes me a good fit for this place as a program director. But also recently I was listening to, um, and I can never say Garba Mate's uh, name probably correctly, but uh, uh, Dr. Mate uh, has, is one of the, the voices on holistic treatment. And what I think is interesting at the moment with, with the way that we're looking at treating these symptoms um, in, in probably modern psychiatry and physiology and biology and neurobiology is that we're looking at the whole person and not just at the symptom. Now, Pia Melody and the model that we're based on here, which uh, Pia is a, still a senior fellow and lecturer at the Meadows and her uh, books in our bookstore, Facing Codependency, Breaking Free, which we run our life skills two groups off, um, have been the, the foundation of this program. It's no secret in our uh, model that 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 in, in, at SPP that, that Lorraine Wood, who I know shares and comes in and done a lecture this week on the 12 steps and shares the recovery story and the story of SPP. Um, she shares her her uh, own recovery journey, which which involved going to the meadows and 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 doing that program. Uh, which was a holistic way of looking at family systems and treatment. So, so P has been doing this and teaching this for a long time, and SPP now in its 21st year is is uh, sort of prided itself on being uh, the, the voice in the treatment community where we look really broadly, not not just at the secondary symptoms, at the underlying factors and how those two things combined, uh, uh, those two things combined, uh, help us get a better picture. Of, of how to treat this. Now, Garber made this uh, statement in, a, in one of his most recent lectures, and it's based on his book, When the Body Says No. And, and he talks about this, the, the, the needs. Now, I'm just about to briefly go over our model, just the snapshot of it, but he talks about when we were children, if I was authentic, meaning if I was in my reality, in my thoughts and in my feelings, and if I'm authentic and I don't get loved, so, so at, at that point, when I when I just be myself, if I don't get that warm regard, if I don't get that that um, nurturing that I need, let alone abuse or trauma, um, then what will happen in our in in the self centeredness is that when I work out I'm not going to be loved. For children, that's a survival uh, mechanism, and from there, if we don't feel like we're going to survive, we have to adapt because children, as John Bradshaw says cannot leave that situation. So we need to make sense of the situation and survive it because we can't walk into the lounge room and say, look, we're out. So today we're going to look at, 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 at the secondary symptoms of anxiety and depression. I'm going to go through a couple of those in a sense of, well, how do I, how do I know? How do I identify it? And, and then we'll look at the model and see where it fits in the model. So, so some of these things uh, are questions we have literally on our um, 
on our website. Uh, you know, do you worry about things in a way that is out of proportion with the problem? Uh, do you have difficulty making decisions? Do you have feelings of dread or worry that sometimes something bad is going to happen? Do you have difficulty focusing or concentrating? Are you absent-minded or forgetful? Or do you have feelings of detachment and unreality? Uh, are you constantly feeling worried, apprehensive, uh, overly alert or on the lookout? Um, avoid social situations or spending time with people because of these things. Um, experience persistent thoughts or ideas or impulses or images that cause significant anxiety, anxiety or distress, worried about things like germs, safety issues, but really in that hypervigilant way. Have any rituals, the OCD rituals, that obsessive compulsive aversion of anxiety, you might wash your hands, check things again and again, arranging things in certain orders, continually seeking, seeking reassurance, that, that idea of one of the, the, uh, the relational aspects of, um, of codependency is that the locus of control is outside of us and the focus is on relationships, are so always looking outside of us for some sort of reassurance that we're okay inside of us. Do we feel shy or inadequate or fearful at times? Um, these are the things we're looking for. Do you feel more irritable, agitated or reactive um, than in the past? So this thing is increasing in its, in its intensity. Do you feel unsafe or at risk even when all is well? Do you feel uh, overwhelmed uh, by fear or experience intense or sudden feelings of panic or doom? Do you feel tense or wound up and notice mus muscle tension? And do you have difficulty sleeping or relaxing? Do you experience the shortness of breath at hyperventilation, the, the, the feel of your heart pounding, palpitations? And these are the folks that would experience those panic attacks. And, and for some of us that are here for complex post-traumatic stress, developmental trauma stress, then, then we can really feel it in that part of the brain, uh, our limbic system, our uh, uh, hypothalamus that, uh, that, that, that holds that stress. So some of the some of the the observable physical symptoms where our body is is letting us know that something's not right: trembling or shaking, sweating, headaches, fatigue, chest pain or discomfort, stomach upsets or nausea, choking sensations, a frequent urination or diarrhea, dizziness or feeling lightheaded, hot or cold flashes. Uh, so it's it's. Um, for some folks, we, we, if we think about these in a continuum, there'll be uh, folks that come in that have got chronic anxiety and panic attacks and, and you might be you know, l l listening and looking at these things and going, wow, that's me. And for others, it might be bits and pieces now and again. And I suppose we're, we're just looking at trying to identify could there be some anxiety or as part of um, what you've you've come to SPP to deal with or what you're in in treatment to deal with? Now, some of the, the the common types. I thought it's always worth going over. Well, what's in our what's in our diagnostic tools? When you come to a place like South Pacific, you will go in and and when we are seeing our psychiatrist or a GP, they use the the diagnostic criteria, the DSM-5 at the moment. And these are some of the the diagnoses we might get if we identify that we've got anxiety. So so generalised anxiety disorder or GAD, an excessive uncontrollable worry about a range of ordinary situations like health or work or finances. Social phobia or social anxiety disorder, so it, it, it causes people to avoid uh, social or performance situations through the fear of being embarrassed or rejected. A panic disorder, it's associated with regular panic attacks which are sudden intense episodes of irrational fear, uh, shortness of breath, dizziness, other physical symptoms. Agoraphobia is often associated with panic disorder and involves avoiding certain situations due to fear having a panic attack. Specific phobias, uh, and so some folks come in and it's really specific and, and there are rational fears that apply to only one particular situation, uh, such as a fear of animals or insects, places or people. Uh, for example, claustrophobia, so the specific fear of enclosed or confined spaces. And then OCD, uh, the obsessive compulsive disorder involving unwanted thoughts and impulses. So obsessions that cause a repetitive and routine behaviour compulsions as a way of coping with anxiety and, and, and it's a very de debilitating disorder when we've got to con con constantly be in those routines, otherwise being inside our own skin is really unbearable. 
some of the things that we, we look at uh, in, in general and what the psychiatric community looks at in general and I thought well it's worth naming these before we then drop into looking at the, the developmental and maturity model. So so in that in, in the DSM-5 what we're looking at is observable uh, things that cause anxiety, family history, uh, having a history of mental health that could be a contributing factor but it doesn't mean that, that um, uh, if there are mental health issues in your family that you'll develop the anxiety but it could be one of the contributing factors. Substance abuse, particularly cannabis, amphetamines, alcohol, sedatives can trigger anxiety systems. Withdrawing from drugs and alcohol can also cause withdrawal related anxiety and I do mention uh, post-acute withdrawal syndrome when we look at um, reality later on in this presentation that, that we can have those symptoms, um, acute withdrawal syndrome lasting for six weeks and then post-acute from six weeks to 18 months. So sometimes we can just have our, our um, biology and physiology under stress will, will, will show some of these symptoms. Physical health issues, so uh, it can be an underlying cause of anxiety disorders, there can be anxiety links for people who suffer asthma, diabetes, heart disease, hormone issues such as thyroid problems. Sometimes anxiety symptoms are the first indication of a physical health issue. It's a, it was an interesting uh, quote at the beginning of um, uh, Dr. Marte, the, the, the idea that um, when he presents his holistic view um, that, that we can end up with these symptoms of uh, anxiety because our body's actually letting us know that there's something wrong, that he, he, he talks about the way that our nervous system, our uh, intestinal system, our skeletal muscular systems, the, the, the digestive system, all these things let us know sometimes, our body will let us know when things aren't okay. Um, and caffeine is another thing that we know that lots of folks come in with anxiety and, 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 and it's an interesting uh, Sometimes when, when we don't look holistically, we're not paying attention to our diet, caffeine, sugar would be have to be another one that, that goes in there where we can be overstimulating our system and then wondering why we're not coping well. And then environmental causes, sometimes we can go through some episodal issues at work, uh, either financial, relational or external triggers. So, so there's some of the things that we look at for, that would be a way of assessing uh, the causes of anxiety but in a minute I will link this more broadly with our model here that I think uh, gives it a much broader base. Now mastering moods we're looking at, at say the, 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 where we would experience anxiety but then there's also starting to look at well depression as a, as a diagnosable symptom. So some of the things I thought was interesting and we present this in our Mastering Moods program that it's, it's quite common in our community that Australian research shows that one in four women and one in six men will experience clinical depression at some time in their life. And, and just that note there, if, well if you took a walk through your local shopping centre and you just looked and did the maths, it's, 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 it's quite a, a big part of our population that at any given time can be, be really suffering. Um, it's difficult, sometimes difficult to identify that, that although depression is relatively easy to spot, only about 20% of cases of clinical depression are correctly diagnosed and treated. Uh, one reason is that d depression can uh, it, it mask itself in physical illness or chronic pain, sleeplessness or fatigue. So people are coming in and dealing with the symptom of the, of the secondary symptom and, and, and you know GPs and, and doctors if they're under stress or you know lots of patients might uh, not screen further. We know that with um, alcohol and drugs sometimes people are going with alcoholism and addiction issues and they'll get treated for the depression but they won't screen further to see that it might be a result of those other things. This means people might not go to the doctor because they feel depressed too, that, uh, that they're fatigued or not sleeping properly and, and uh, they might report that they're in some sort of pain or that but they're not going to go in and sort of at depth share and, and I think look more and more these days the GP will refer onto a psychologist if they see these things but sometimes it is legitimately difficult to, to identify let alone start to treat. So how do you know you're depressed? Uh, our, our mood, our sense of well-being can feel quite de depressed at times, uh, loss of interest and enjoyment in daily activities, reduced uh, interest uh, um, in, in reduced energy leading to increased fatigue, um, 
marked tiredness after only slight efforts, so sometimes just doing the smallest thing just seems too much. A reduced concentration and attention, so we just don't focus like we used to. Noticing really our esteem and our confidence, our sense of worth, it can be really low, and it might necessarily be that way at times, but when we're in that depressed state and mood, we'll, we can notice that. Uh, we'll, we'll start to identify guilt and especially, especially worthlessness, which we would call toxic shame here. And, and I'm going to get on uh, in a little while and talk about the, the idea of the, the, the core beliefs, those shame messages that would create that sense of worthlessness. We can have bleak and pessimistic views of the future and be in hopelessness, ideas of self-harm and suicide, sleep disturbances. You'll notice that in your daily moral inventories and when you're speaking to your psychiatrist, they'll get very interested around um, uh, early morning waking or difficulty getting to sleep and just starting to notice appetite or weight fluctuations. These, these are some of the things that we're looking for is how you know you would have have it. And I suppose I just wanted to throw in, in, in mastering moods when we're certainly, you know, we we don't shy away from the CBT model of, of dealing with depression and or anxiety, but, but we take much more of a holistic view of it. But we still will, what I wanted to put this up for is that we will look at all early experiences, early trauma. Um, one of the things that I, I thought was interesting is that we we talk a bit about dysfunctional parenting and and then people can argue well what's dysfunctional and isn't isn't every family dysfunctional but but one of the things that research is showing us now is that we can have a fairly functional family but uh, it functions under stress for periods of time and at key parts of a child's development that 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 functioning under stress and the the way that children will co-regulate in in the way that their parents are regulating themselves. So if they're under stress, a child's going to start to pick up on that stress. So, so just looking back and noticing, was there any stress in the way that they related in, in those major caregivers? Early experiences of rejection or abandonment, we get very, uh, we get really clear at, at needing to, well, you'll know if you come to SBP, well, we want to do timelines, we go to the changes program, we thoroughly look at those early uh, childhood experiences. Core beliefs, which I'll talk more about later on, but definitely what are some of those things through repetition of, of trauma or stress parenting that we then took on due to the self-centeredness of childhood that we now run on and can run on in real auto pilot sort of ways as well. So I'll talk about that when we get to the model. Um, now, when, when we've got that as, a, as, as part of those core beliefs as a result of those early experiences, we can have something come up r right now in the, the, the our daily life that just becomes an instant trigger. And those automatic negative thoughts, if we're not conscious of those, can really start to drive um, how we uh, behave. So if we are not clued into that I'm not important or she doesn't care or that no one cares about me, if we don't really clue in that that's a developmentally uh, tra traumatised reaction from either the wounded child or we go to our adult adapted child, then when we start to behave in ways that show that immaturity, we, we mightn't see that we're sort of co-creating now the stress we're under. We, we definitely start to tune into and look at the feelings that are created as a result of that. Now, what's interesting here is that as we start to look at uh, the, the neurobiology of, um, of uh, uh, interpersonal neurobiology, the, the, the new school of thinking where they're bringing in quantum physics and physio physiology, neurobiology, biology, sociology, we're bringing all these aspects in, that the physiological feelings generally are what we start to notice, that, you know, are not at the end anymore, but it's we get our data from the beliefs, the, the way the body responds is where we start to get our data first. So in this particular CBT model, it, it brings up the idea that, well, we're going to have physiological feelings as a result of this, and we certainly will, but they also, our viscera, our body, the way our nervous system reacts is going to be at times the first response that we have. And so when we do mastering moods, when we do our PTSD program, we, we want people to tune into their body and and I'll talk more as we go on through here about why and how we do that. What does recovery take? Uh, people that have watched webinars of mine before or seen me lecture, I, I hang on to these three things. It, it's a big thing to, to um, turn, to, 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 to get into recovery. 
Um, at SPP, we have those three pillars to, to work the program, uh, tr you know, trust the process and follow the rules. But to do that, I've got to turn up. And it might sound really odd if you're sitting, how, how am I not turning up? I'm here, I'm sitting in front of you. But it's quite interesting. We can come into treatment and shut down. We can come in here and not tell the truth. We can be in group and we, due to our sort of untreated codependency, might want people to like us. So I'm not going to say what I'm really thinking or feeling because I'm afraid of what you might think and feel about me if I do that. So taking a risk and turning up is the first thing. A PMality in some of the lectures online will just say, look, thank you for coming. Thank you for making that decision to turn up here. And, and when we do a family program, it's uh, generally one of the things we'll say there. It's a, you, you put yourself in the minority by turning up. And then there's this decision to grow up. Now, sometimes that, that um, growing up can sound a bit uh, punitive, uh, you know, especially if you've come from family systems where it was one of those parental phrases of just grow up when we were immature and needed to be immature. But, that, but what this phrase means in recovery is that, that, that for me to get well, that it's my functional adult that I need to, I am now responsible for doing the healing. Whatever happened and whenever it happened, uh, I'm now powerless over changing. What I can do, though, is develop the, the, the functioning skills I need to move forward. And that's that. the last point there where it talks about facing our reality. It's time to sort of look in and, 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 uh, and, and tune into what's happening for us. Where that fits in the model is in the functional adult column, fourth blue box down, is it's, it's about awareness. Uh, the, one of the, if I, had to, if I had to sort of start somewhere on this model, it's, it, it, it's where Pia Melody says, well, regarding our dependency needs, we need to become aware of and appropriately meets the needs of self and, and others. Now, becoming aware is, is, is uh, becoming aware of is, is, is a lot harder than it sounds. Generally, if you've come in here with secondary symptoms of any form of addiction or moderation issue, if you've come in here with some active depression and anxiety, we could, that, that's generally a result of, of those untreated primary symptoms that we spent a long time running away from ourselves. Uh, the, the Carl Jung famously said that uh, if we don't make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our life and we'll call it fate. And I, and I know that when I went to treatment, I was just in the fate. I was just trying to explain to people, look, you don't understand, I'm an addict, I can't stop. But I had no idea that there was untreated primary symptoms. I never at all connected it to the history of growing up in a family with chronic mental illness and chronic rage issues, um, a chronic abandonment from the from a father who was uh, not emotionally available. We the, none of those things made sense, and I certainly wasn't asking those questions. They were they were the uh, that was the unconsciousness living itself out. So in recovery, what we're looking at is becoming aware of, and and so what what I want to go through now is, you know, th this model that, that gets presented here at SPP is that we, we generally, when people come into treatment, ask you when you come first into group, can you just describe what's happened over the last three to six months that's led to this decision? And that generally highlights the crisis and unmanageability that, that, we've, that we've created in our life, that, that's there now as a result of these symptoms. Then we ask you to do a timeline, and the timeline for us, what we're looking for is trying to get that story straight. Uh, Dr. Dan Siegel says that one of the, they've researched that what sort of helps people not pass trauma on to their children if they were traumatized, and that's where people have got their story straight. They've, they've told their story and made sense of their story. So we might have been traumatized, but we now have, it, 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 we can share it in such a way that it makes sense to us. And that's part of breaking that family legacy. Now at SPP, we've taught that for a long time. It says their untreated primary symptoms lead to secondary symptoms resulting in that current crisis, unmanageability and intimacy issues. So in your timeline, we're asking you to go back and have a look at that 0 to 18 years and, and see was there any lack of nurturing, any um, trauma or abuse, as I mentioned before, any stressed parenting um, that might have uh, uh, created um, an environment in the family where where those basic needs never got met, that need of being valued, that need of being safe in your vulnerability, that need to be 
um, perfectly imperfect in your reality, that your body, thoughts, feelings and behaviours were, um, you got that relationship where you learned about those things age appropriately over time and certainly learned that you're perfectly imperfect, that to be human is to be imperfect and that to have healthy shame when we note our imperfection simply means that we have a, a sense of embarrassment at times when we err in our humanness and that, that, that when we have needs and wants age appropriately that our family systems there to either meet those especially around needs or to at least be in relationship with us about our wants. If a child gets that environment they will be able to live each moment as it is and be quite spontaneous and open and be connected to themselves and connected to others. But when that trauma happens the profound thing that happens is we disconnect from ourselves. As, as that opening uh, quote from um, uh, Gabor Mate uh, uh, is, is that if, if I attempt to be authentic and then I'm not loved in that authenticity, then I will have to um, uh, go into a survival mechanism because it will feel sort of life-threatening to a child because you're a little person in a big person's world. You can't meet those needs for yourself, but we will adapt to, to, to survive. And that's the wounded child, adult adapted child um, uh, ego states that we get people to get curious about. Now we, in, when you do your timeline that might be the first time anyone ever shares any of their trauma history here and for some folks that come in and their hands up high and they're saying look I've got a lot of trauma and uh, I really need to deal with it and for some folks that come in and say oh, listen this place really rabbits on a lot about trauma um, I'm just here to deal with these secondary symptoms. All we ask is that people get curious and this is the reason why. That survival mechanism of a child um, really activates very early. Um, now I'm no scientist but I'm an enthusiast and why my understanding of the triune brain, the three major parts of the brain, uh, thank God someone made it simple for folks like me, that, that at the bottom of the, the, the brain stem that, that I've got a, a, my, my instinctual part of the brain, my reptilian part of the brain drives me towards care and so that's that, that, that instinct that I have that drives me towards care but I've got the limbic system that sits on top of that and, and I know that for you folks watching live if Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain where he talks about the top of the wrist, if the, if the, 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 the forearm is the, the spine, at the top of the wrist is the top of the brainstem, the reptilian part of the brain, then that instinctual part of the brain that drives us towards care then has sitting on top of it the limbic system. And the limbic system is what helps us either fight, flight or freeze away from threat. So early on if we're in stress or threat um, what can happen is those two things activate at the same time and we have what we call disassociation. Uh, the Dr. Ed Tronic, uh, Dr. Stephen Porches will, will describe this much more thoroughly than I will but just for the purpose of this model we note that when painful situations happen in, for children when we can't escape it, especially in that early naught to seven years, uh, we will have to be in the lounge room and remain there, we can't escape it so we learn to suppress it, then repress it and then for the very painful things that a child feels might be life threatening and, and just, just give me, let me give you this example, ongoing humiliation of a child is, feels life threatening to a child. When, when our reality, when our existence is simply humiliated regularly. A child that is unbearable. So we can have suppression, repression, then disassociation. Then when we get from 7 to 17 and we really kick into that adult adapted way of re relating um, to our environment, then, then from that point on we, we start to learn defence mechanisms and we start to uh, disconnect from how we feel, from our own body, we disconnect um, from, from our own feelings through these defences and, and at the bottom there of primary symptoms it talks about, well the wounded child reflects how we felt during problematic experiences, the adult adapted child reflects the way we were parented it. So we eventually learn and in uh, SPP we'll, we'll do uh, defence mechanisms lectures where we're really getting people to sort of tune in. How do you do it? How do you disconnect? And what did you witness in your family of origin? These are really important 
And the reason why I'm, I'm, I've moved from depression and anxiety to these primary symptoms is that untreated primary symptoms mean that we function in the extremes and under stress. And what we know now is then that, that from that early developmental trauma and then the survival mechanisms that really get us to disconnect from ourself mean that, that, that our brain is actually functioning in a way that's highly stressed. It's releasing the brain chemicals that are, that are that cortisol based, adrenaline based, where we're, we're perceiving now things that, that, that are relationally threatening that mightn't even be there anymore, but we're so hypervigilant. And that's when we start to see secondary symptoms develop. Now, John Bradshaw said, uh, in, he's the fellow that wrote Healing the Shame That Binds You and Homecoming, etc. He said that anybody that experienced developmental trauma would have at least mild anxiety, that would have at least mild depression. And I think for some of us, that could be buried under observable addiction issues or rage issues. So, so this untreated primary symptoms lead to secondary symptoms. And so that's when we see that, that, that we will then start to show the cracks in, in either the, the, the depression, the, the, the rage issues that start to come up, the physical illness. So sometimes people come to SBP with that chronic pain, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, heart palpitations. Uh, we, we, we might have uh, the, the sort of musc muscular issues um, that we have tried medical interventions and it's just not working and we see that it's, well, it's our body under stress uh, that, that when we don't deal with the whole problem, then, then what can happen is we just try and deal with the symptoms. And Pia Melody talks about just dealing with the secondary symptoms is like giving somebody a, a, a codrill cold and flu tablet that will help them with their flu symptoms, but it won't kill the infection that's driving the flu. So we can come in and, and uh, we could go and get some pharmacotherapy just for the physical symptoms of depression and anxiety, but the medication might override some of the symptoms, but if we don't deal with the underlying issues, uh, we'll never learn to really come back into our body, get connected and start to regulate. Now that's not a rant against uh, medication, absolutely not. There's times when we come in and in crisis and in unmanageability that we'll need that pharmacotherapy just to get some balance. So we really need to trust the assessment of the psychiatrist when they are suggesting maybe we need um, something just to help us come back into our body in a way that calms us so we can learn to start to explore what might be underneath. So I hope you certainly hear that. So the rest of what I want to talk about is, well, well, how do we then go into re recovery from what PM Melody says, the two recoveries? Firstly, from the secondary symptoms, in this case, looking at mastering our moods, um, um, and, and secondly, from our history, those that untreated primary symptoms and secondary symptoms. And, and, and the last little bit of that is if we've got those two things, the wounded child, adult adapted child, untreated, and these symptoms of depression, anxiety and, and other addictions, then relationally we're going to be under incredible stress. There's no way we can be having healthy relationships. You might have a fantastic adult adapted child that can maintain the guise of a healthy relationship, but, but you'll see a profound um, dishonesty usually in those relationships. So awareness is the key. We, we really need to, to start to get aware and, and I think uh, we talk about in the 12th step having a spiritual awakening and I just mentioned this in a 12th in a, a step meeting that we held on site that um, uh, sometimes our spiritual awakening as a result of the 12th step is a rude awakening and I think awareness um, in our Life Skills 2 program, one of the, the clients that, that comes to that, uh, we've sort of got a bumper sticker from that group that says that, that awareness is the booby prize, it's, it, 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 it really is the examined life's no picnics, one of those old sayings. So, so one of the tools we use in SBP is the Jahari's window tool of trying to, uh, as Jung said, try and get that, what are some of my blind spots here? What are some of the things that I've, I'm keeping secret and hidden from others? And, and why we use that is, and why we use group work is that, well, if you come into treatment, that adult adapted child, wounded child, the way we cope and the things that get, the felt sense that gets triggered, it's going to get triggered in group because we, we just know that those defence mechanisms um, that have kept us safe out there, um, once you come into SPP and, and we really hope you give up the smoking, you go on the mindful eating program, so you go into low sugar, no caffeine, you're away from your drugs of addiction, your behaviours of addiction, um, or at least get the opportunity to do that. We always know we're trying to support the community to stay in their integrity around that. Um, 
then we know people's stuff is going to come up. And so it's it, the good thing here is that if you can deal with it in the therapeutic community amongst your peers, it's, it, it puts us in good stead when we leave to be able to go back into our families of creation and families of origin and hopefully maintain it. So let's look a little bit at, at, at this. Now I mentioned the Jahari's window. I won't spend much time on this. You could do a whole hour on the Jahari's window, but, but there'll be things, when we're talking about awareness is the key, um, one of the, 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 the tools I always loved about uh, how to make recovery a reality is, is the how of recovery. I need to be honest, I need to be open, and I need to be willing. And so that, that, that when we come to group, if I could give anyone a gift in recovery, it would be take a risk and just share what's happening. Uh, you, you, you'll, um, you can't save your ass and your face at the same time is an old saying. And, and um, uh, if we don't get humble, we'll get humiliated is another one. So it's time when you're in treatment to take a risk and sell the truth. Now, if I do that, sometimes I'm going to get feedback from the group that, that they're going to highlight things that even though I've been honest, I can't actually see the blind spots that I've got that happen relationally. But getting that feedback and then, um, you know, moving it into the open pain, starting to take a risk and sharing things from the hidden pain. Now, if I'm doing that, more and more of that unknown, unconscious stuff is going to bubble to the surface. For some of you folks that might be listening that have done the changes program or extensive family of origin work, you might have started with, with a lot of blind spots about recovery and then you're sitting in there and hearing other people share some of their story. You might have even got it when you've heard other people's timelines and thought, oh my God, I'd completely forgotten that that was an experience I had. And it might be a small one, it might be a huge one. But, but sometimes just by taking a risk and sharing to be known and turning up, we're going to get more and more information about ourselves. And that's going to guide us on, on, on how to go forward in our recovery. Now, when, I'm going, when we talk about reality here and um, this, this idea of um, Pia Melody, when, she, when, when, when we talk about through treatment, recovery, intimacy and reparenting, the, the, the main role now that I have in my own recovery is I've got to turn up to this and grow up into this functional adult. And to do that, it's going to be tuning into what's going on for me. Now, I remember uh, certainly going to treatment and, and especially when it came to dealing with rage and I remember a therapist asking, well, what, ha what do you feel and what triggers it and what, do what are you thinking at the time? And uh, that just confused me. I was just a young guy and I thought, man, this hits the, I, I explained it as sometimes when we're not aware of what's going on inside of us, the behaviour can just come smashing through us, a bit like being run over from behind by a car we didn't hear coming. It's just a shock and before we know it, we're in behaviour. So in recovery, when we come into treatment, hopefully you give up those addictions, so you stop sort of disconnecting your body, at least artificially, you're going to start to drop into getting some of the, the information that your body has got around certain situations. One of the things that Dr. Mate uh, asked in his lecture was he said, hands up, and, and uh, for you guys in the Rock Castle, you can do this because you can see each other, um, hands up anyone that had a gut feeling about something and didn't act on it, you know, it's, uh, or, or had a gut feeling about something and acted on it and were really grateful that you did. And generally, generally that gut feeling when we're in tune with it, you know, if your hand's in the air, it's like, yeah, you'll, you'll be rem remembering times where, well, wow, my intuition, I really felt it in my gut this wasn't right. Uh, the old, uh, the, uh, the, the, the spiritualist and religious thinker uh, uh, William James talked about we don't, um, we don't feel fear and run, it's the act of running that lets us know that we're in fear. So, so Pia Melody and her model at the core of that functional adult is I need this information about me. I need to start turning into how does my body feel. I know in our PTSD program um, today, they, they looked at so, somatic experiencing. They looked at starting to tune into what's, what literally happens inside of my body. What's some of the information I get when I'm under stress, when I think of a, a post-traumatic uh, stress trigger, just starting to learn how to identify how the body feels. Am I tighten the jaw, do my hands start to tremble, do I get sweaty on my palms, does the hair on the back of my neck go up, does my heart rate go up or down, really starting to tune in. The idea of tuning into our thinking, um, really paying attention through our timeline, through our history work and changes, what are some of the experiences I had that learnt, led me to those core beliefs, 
and what are some of the feelings that I'm now starting to tune into. Some people come in here really in tune with their wounded child and so they're having huge feelings all of the time and other folks can come in and be really disconnected from our feeling and be more in that adapted reality and really hyper vigilant and disconnected. So it's just about, it's just we've just got to start with where we're at. One's not better than the others, uh, the other it's, it's just starting where we're at and then starting to tune into what are some of those behaviours that I do. Now the stuff in red there is just for you folks that come in that have literally got um, a post-traumatic stress reaction at time due to some triggers, we, we are going to activate, as I said before, that hand model of the brain, the limbic system of the brain will fire and as Dan Siegel says, it flips the executive functioning, the frontal cortex up and we will react in such a way that just our, our neurobiology activates our physiology and we just run, we fight, flight or free. So um, some of our programs, PTSD and Mastering Moods, get us um, starting to learn how to regulate our viscera first before I can then get my cognition back and check out what I need to do. So I just wanted to start with that because this, the, the reality issues and anxiety and including depression mean that at a body level we're looking for that complex PTSD. Um, uh, that's not an official diagnosis anymore. Hopefully we're heading when they eventually get the DSM-6 out that we'll have a de developmental trauma disorder diagnosis we can talk about. But we're looking at that brain level of um, you know how does my fight, flight and freeze trigger in, in early recovery. And I mentioned before post-acute withdrawal syndrome. For you guys that are here for addiction, it's not just the getting over the half-life of the drugs that this is going to cause us trouble. Because we have, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an arousal template in the brain uh, syndrome, um, we, we know that once we stop acting out, that's not the end of it. And this includes process addictions too, that we're going to have at times ebbs and flows in the way that the body uh, recalibrates itself and that can go up to 18 months. And this is an important and unfortunate bit of data for addicts to, to know because uh, you can do everything in a day that you need to do for your recovery and at times still feel dreadful. And, and, and if we were basing our recovery on how we felt on that day, you might think, well, I didn't, get, I didn't get clean or sober in any of my addictions to feel this bad, but that could just be part of the consequence of using addictions uh, for, that period of, for a period of time to regulate how you feel, and it will pass. We do get through that, but that first sort of 18 months can at times be tough. What we're looking for in our thinking is any cognitive distortions and defences. What are some of the things over time in my adaption, my adult adapted child, that I learnt to keep me safe? So we, 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 we will pay attention to those and need to pay attention to those. In our inpatient program, we have the, um, the defence mechanism lecture and we certainly do the realities and boundaries where we're looking at our core beliefs. Um, in our day programs, we really start to tune into, especially when we do our realities, because if we share realities over and over and over again, we'll get better at finding out what are the, the key ones that I, I get triggered in, because they might be different than some of your peers. Um, we're looking at some of those re repetitive uh, thoughts, those cognitive distortions that we can have and it's really good to get in, in tune with those because they're not going to go away just because we're abstinent, they're not going to go away just because we have insight. These are ways that our neurobiology fires up our neurons that have fired together, have wired together so we're quite powerless over how we see certain triggers for some time. So, so paying attention to those uh, is a huge uh, step forward in in starting to deal with depression and anxiety. Feeling realities. We have our lecturers in inpatient, in, for the inpatient program on feelings. We bombard people tuning in every day with how they feel and looking at those eight faces, those eight primary feelings. But what we're trying to look at too is, well, when do I feel sort of adult appropriate feelings? I mean, if the situation was 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 this big, that then then the feeling was that big and when do we have something where the situation was this big but the feelings this big, we're overreacting. So those toxic feeling realities and I'll go over that in a second. Um, the wounded child is based on how we felt when the abuse happened um, and our adult adapted child certainly is based on the way we were parented. So that's that, that more the cognitive distortions and defence mechanisms. And one of the things that uh, I think it takes a little bit of uh, getting used to and it's a bit of a bumper sticker here is that we come to treatment to feel better but part of becoming a functional adult and reparenting the wounded child and adult adapted child is that we need to get better at feeling. 
and and that can be tough when you've spent your life running away from those feelings, especially the toxic feelings. But that's what treatment's about, is starting to do that shame reduction and, and start to really um, reduce the impact of those sort of toxic levels of feelings by identifying cognitive distortions, defense mechanisms and core beliefs. I don't think we can deal with depression and anxiety successfully without doing this work. It's, you cannot separate these two. Just dealing with the symptoms of depression and anxiety through pharmacotherapy alone is not a recommended treatment this day and age, and certainly not with um, what we do at South Pacific Private. And the last part is change is behavioural. Now, it's a very CBT approach, but, but in the treatment of anything, um, whether it be depression, anxiety or addiction issues, waiting to feel better so we do that next thing for our um, recovery is something that sometimes we just can't afford to do. That's the growing up bit. Um, if we've had those, um, you know, especially around holistic treatment, mild and gentle exercise, whether we feel like it or not, can be a real step forward for someone with depression as it, as it, it um, you know, for a long time there we'd, we'd say, well, you know, do some ongoing exercise because uh, you, you will look better or you will be healthier. But in actual fact, a bit like how we deal with smoking now, um, is that it's not so much, oh, you give up smoking, you're going to, you know, the, the medical approach is you're going to uh, be this much healthier every time you knock back a cigarette. What we know about smoking is our mood. We, we smoke in the belief it's going to relieve our mood, but it actually has a short burst of relief followed by a, a real dip where we end up feeling worse. And the same with um, exercise. Why they suggest exercise is the research is telling us our mood improves by the, uh, the greater level of oxygen in our bloodstream, by our, uh, our heart and our muscles relieving stress, that our actually mood legitimately increases. Whether we lose weight or not, whether we get cardiovascularly fitter or not, it's actually not the benefit in early recovery. It's just getting out there, getting the body moving and freeing up some of uh, uh, those, those more healthier brain chemicals that get triggered by the activity. So the, the, the common beliefs and descriptive words and phrases, the things that, that um, we, uh, I mean, the other, if, if, I, if I could sit up in my little Harry Potter office under the stairs up here and, and um, come up with a magic spell, it would be to get uh, inpatients every day at least writing out one reality as something that got under their skin because if you can do a reality and identify the negative sort of common belief, uh, it will start to tell you where your shame sits for you. Uh, John Bradshaw, we show the resource here, Healing the Shame that Binds You by John Bradshaw. Uh, Brene Brown is one of the big uh, modern voices on, on dealing with shame differently, getting, getting in touch with, that, with, with ourselves and, and, and loving ourselves in a, in a, in a deep way. The, the common beliefs here, I am unimportant, unacceptable, I'm unsafe, I'm invisible, I'm inadequate, I'm untrustworthy, I don't matter, I don't deserve, I'm unlovable, I'm inappropriate, I'm insignificant, I'm powerless, um, I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy of support, I don't belong, I don't count. And these are just the suggested few. There's more, I'm wrong, I'm dumb. Uh, it, it's, it's really what are the messages that you got through repetitious, stressed parenting or less than nurturing parenting or abuse? If we're not in tune with these, this is what Jung's saying, this is the, the if I don't turn up and really start to focus and find out what these are, um, I, I will be living on them unconsciously. And, and these are the beliefs that our inner child will have, our wounded child will have, that our adult adapted child builds defences so we don't have to feel the shame that um, is felt. Now Bradshaw talks about the difference between healthy shame. Now healthy shame is, is, I need to have healthy shame, it lets me know I'm human, I'm imperfect and that I can impact others. My healthy shame teaches me that I need to have limits, etc. Now with with toxic shame, toxic shame is when I experience that less than nurturing um, uh, parenting or abusive parenting when at a time when I'm developing and I'm in my self-centeredness. So I will take that on and I will either carry the shame, meaning that if you've shamed me, um, I, I will, uh, you've, if you've shamed me, I'll, I'll feel the shame and have it as induced shame. But, but if you act out around me, I'll carry your shame. Now, for you folks that have done changes um, or family of origin work with your external therapist, you'll know that 
once you identify what, what the trauma was, you'll start to see what, what did you make up about you. And when you identify what you made up about you, then you can then you can start to see the message that goes with it. Now this isn't a realities webinar, and we've certainly got one of them on our website, but I always think that there's a couple of key things here. Our common beliefs will reflect those core needs of a child. They're either about our value, our safety and vulnerability, our sense of identity or our needs and wants. And so whenever you're sharing a reality, one simple tip is, please, you might feel, if, if you're overwhelmed and you want to say seven or eight or all of those, then, then it generally tells you you're in your wound. And to have a, a talking boundary, just pick the top three. If you really want someone to hear you, they're not going to hear all ten. They're going to switch off. It'll be too much. We need to practice containment. So pick the ones that are the key ones for you, and that'll give you a better chance of being heard and of the ability to practice containment. Now, if we have those core beliefs untreated, then generally at a feeling level, they will trigger toxic level of feelings. Now, the toxic level of feelings are um, even or even around joy and love can be really uncomfortable. Enmeshment, whenever we feel connected, we can feel really connected and enmeshed and lost in that experience, either really positively or really uh, negatively. For fear, instead of feeling healthy, fear is wisdom that, that, that we can feel terror and panic. And, and when we're looking at anxiety, it's that, that, that toxic fear can be something that's at the, one of the key feelings that um, we can feel at the, at the core of our um, uh, sense of self when it comes to our feeling reality. When it comes to pain, the gift of pain is healing, but if we are unable to feel pain or we've got a lot of pain collected, and especially if we go back in our, t our childhood around fear and pain and, and, uh, and shame and anger, you'll notice that, um, that, that depression is that toxic level of, of, of pain. Rage uh, can be that, that bottled up and toxic level of anger. Isolation connected to loneliness really being immobilized when it comes to the experience of guilt. And then at the bottom there, that toxic level of shame is worthlessness. So we don't feel mildly embarrassed. My inherent worth is completely uh, in question. And, and, and we've got a good uh, shame lecture on our, our website. So, so the, now the reason I mention these is that the depression and anxiety is a secondary symptom. If we're living where we have got untreated, uh, primary symptoms, where at its core these common beliefs exist and these toxic level of feelings are untreated, then there is no way that we're going to feel good inside of our own skin and we will see those symptoms get played out in our life. Now this, this, this uh, for, for um, impatience, for people that have done the program, what, what, what we're talking about here, the functional adult, uh, th there's no magic functional adult that's going to be developed and all of a sudden our wounded child and adult adapted ego child states will go away. I think what happens in treatment is that functional adult d d develops to reparent us. It turns up and says, okay, it's my job now to affirm, it's my job now to nurture, it's my job now to set limits with others. And, and, and in regards to development, I, I need to learn to esteem myself, I need to send functional, set functional boundaries with others, I need to uh, own uh, Katie, where are you going? Myself appropriately, um, my, my, my reality appropriately. I've got to self-care interdependently. I'm on a call. It's certainly Katie. okay to have uh, needs and wants. It's just how we share those. Um, I suppose it's okay to have a vulnerable request of another, Katie. but it's not. Um, I'm just I'm just having a little bit of a someone needs to mute themselves if that's okay. I'm hearing a, a conversation in the background, so just. I'm not a good multitasker, folks, um, as some of you already know. So, so with, um, with that functional adult, what we're looking at is I just need to learn what, what's becoming conscious. Unfortunately, in early recovery, it's becoming conscious of um, when I'm triggered into my worthlessness, my less than around my self-esteem, when I notice that I feel too vulnerable, that I haven't got those boundaries, either physically, sexually in particular for folks that have got sexual trauma, or um, <coughs> internally, that my thoughts and feelings, um, get, I get overwhelmed in that, 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 um, that, that I just can't filter and keep people's reality of me out, or their reality, or what they think of me out. 
that bad and rebellious, learning to know when I really go into a shame attack and feel flawed fundamentally about myself. Now, some folks come in here and we've got what I would call um, shame binds, and I'll highlight those in a second. And if you've got a shame bind around your existence, then that can be overwhelming when that gets triggered. And, and in regards to our functional adult around needs and wants is noticing when we get into our woundedness and that we really feel too needy. And, and it's our job to, to, to manage that with the support of others. If we start to do that, I mean, one of the ways to note we're in our wounded child is when we're just simply out of control. And, and it will feel out of control inside of us and we might act out that out of control to others. But it'll be, it'll, we'll feel small, it'll feel young to us when we start to tune into it and we'll act dependent and childish. Now, when you don't know that that's happening, that might be one of the blind spots that gets pointed out in group work. And it can be a bit of a shock when you really feel you're right and that you're, you're in your adult and then you, you get that rude awakening that, wow, I've been acting like a five-year-old and I had no idea. Now, the, the, the other part of that reparenting is noticing when I go into my adult adapted child and we'll know we're in that when we're attacking, criticizing, abandoning and indulging ourselves. We'll see how better than, we'll be arrogant, uh, judgmental and grandiose. We'll be invulnerable, so we're operating behind walls. So whenever we've got a, an active defense mechanism, we're being invulnerable. We'll, we'll try and be good and perfect, and that's simply, you know, as an as an as a, um, adult human being, we're, we're, we're perfectly imperfect. So whenever I'm trying to be good or perfect, and I always try and squash in there, if you're being super rebellious, that, that you really don't care, uh, that's, that, that's us being in an extreme state. Anti-dependent, needless and wantless. And the, the big thing here is if you're really trying to be in control. Both these things might be something that within the Jahari's window get pointed out by group members. I certainly know in early recovery I didn't have any idea and I've certainly worked with folks that we can be really blind to these two ego states. So when we're coming in and we're dealing with um, this, this uh, reparenting, it's starting to heal the shame that binds you, that drives the anxiety, that will we'll, we'll feel overwhelmed by it. Toxic shame is the in um, ability to sort of be spontaneous and live in the moment. And, and so um, it's identifying when we're in those two and starting to get the care we need. And, and if I can take you back to that awareness that we start to um, – look outside of, um, of those old behaviours that we medicated and start to appropriately meet those needs. So it's, you know, I, I think um, it's starting to talk about those secrets. And what, you, what we'll find around shame is it'll attach itself to our value, it'll, it will have shame binds around setting boundaries. Pia Melody says that boundaries are the most important functional adult skill to, to set. And I think what causes a lot of anxiety and depression is that we don't have this inherent worth. We don't have the ability to set healthy boundaries. I'm not in tune with those core negative beliefs and those shameful feelings, especially in tune with my body and the, 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 the way it's reacting. Um, and, and I'll have those behavioral shame binds where I'll feel like I'm going to get it wrong or I'm never going to get it right. Um, and those dependency, mate, if I've got shame around needs and shame about getting my, my wants met, then there's no way I'm going to feel good inside my own skin. And I think we'll definitely see on that continuum uh, evidence of anxiety and depression. This recovery map I won't spend a lot of time with, but I, it, 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 I, I always put it in there because we, we are, I'm, I'm talking about dealing with something at depth here from, from looking from that core sense of self where that shame lives and, and that if I'm not tuning into those primary defense mechanisms, the family roles that I might have gone into to try and survive, the behavioral cover-ups and defenses that I've got, and the syndromes of the shame, the, the addiction, the depression, the anxieties, um, if I just try and deal with the anxieties and depressions on the outside and not deal with that internal core, um, I'm going to find that I'm not going to really get well and I'll get disillusioned with getting getting sober. I'll be saying, well, I still feel awful or giving up drugs or, or giving up gambling or giving up sex and love addiction. I'll, I'll find that I'm not going to feel better about myself because I haven't dealt with those underlying issues. So in a nutshell, what we're looking at here is that, that that early developmental trauma causes that immaturity and that childhood trauma and immaturity drive unmanageability. So the depression, the anxiety is part of that unmanageability. 
Now, when they're not treated, that's going to create relational problems. So, so recovery really does rely on us going, right, the buck stops with me. I've got to get the right care that I need for myself, and I need to be gentle in that care that I offer myself. There was a wonderful post from the Meadows today on their website, and they talked about the idea that, that when I'm in my symptoms of depression or anxiety, and they were citing depression today, that, that if I just go into my adult adapted child and, and attack myself and judge myself and criticize myself, it's the equivalent of having someone that's an athlete break their ankle and then get up and just make themselves run and have no uh, support for themselves, um, no gentleness for themselves, no self-love, that they actually need to stop and rest and repair. So, so when it comes to our anxiety and, and, and depression, noticing what these symptoms are, noticing that they can be quite broad and cross, across a whole a spectrum of disorders, they can be comorbidly connected to other addictions and moderation issues, and that they can get triggered in our relationships and be hard to deal with in our relationships. So the developmental trauma we certainly uh, we've, we've, we, we talk about here is the physical, sexual, emotional, intellectual and spiritual enmeshment um, and abandonment issues, but, but it's the main thing that it affects the way the brain chemistry um, uh, reacts to, to um, uh, in its development and can predispose us to addictions and compulsions, moderation issues. So, so what we know now is that, 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 that when people are coming into treatment, and we've known this here for a long time, we really need to look physically at what's the impact of your body living under stress uh, and as well as just those thoughts and those feelings. <coughs> For you folks that, 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 that have depression and anxiety as a result of that developmental trauma, then we know more about that now and how to treat that than ever before. We, we really do look at that, that those symptoms around attachment, what sort of attachment did we have, um, how's that impacted our development. We look at our biology, our, at the sensory mode of development. Uh, we look at, 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 at the way that um, uh, our uh, somatic symptoms are now as a result of, of, of that that um, disorganized, uh, abandoning, um, at, at the, the different types of attachment uh, difficulties that we can have, those different sorts of trauma. So we look fairly deeply at that. And I suppose what we've learned now, and for you guys that are doing our D PTSD program, is that it, it, it's, it's looking at how we deal with um, what we call affect regulation. If we've if we've come through that developmental uh, trauma uh, and we've got this depression and anxiety, then essentially what we're, we, we, we're noticing is that we, we don't regulate well. We, we, when we were under stress or in a house that was under stress, we never got the regulation then and we're not regulating now. So it's learning how to identify when we're under stress and starting to, to um, to get a language that can communicate what's going on for us right now. We will look at disassociations that happen because some folks are going to come in here and, and when we get that trigger, we can go into really uh, overwhelming states of distress or fight or flight or freeze. I won't spend a lot of time on that, but, but what I will say is that you will notice that in treatment we look at behavioural impulse control uh, tools that help us start to soothe um, uh, where we can, uh, those symptoms when they get triggered. So when, um, when we uh, are looking at these symptoms of trauma, and uh, one of the, the ways that we see this trauma in action will be, and you'll notice down there in the secondary symptoms column that that, that we will have as a, as a secondary symptom of our dependency needs when they weren't met. If we were too dependent and act anti-dependent, then we start, that's where we'll start to see in regards to ourselves uh, the addiction issues. And for you folks that might have a, an addiction, think along the terms of when you're under stress, when you feel anxious or depressed, what behaviours do you do or not do that, that, are, that are moderation issues for you? Um, it, it it might be you've got an alcohol addiction, but you might rely on alcohol sometimes to medicate how you feel. It might be that you've got a bona fide eating disorder, but you might rely on sugar or caffeine or food either insatiably 
or restrictively as a way of trying to medicate those feelings. So we're just looking at, 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 at what, what are those symptoms and then you'll notice all around it with secondary symptoms, if we're not dealing with the self-esteem, we're going to have the negative control. If we're not dealing with the boundary issues, we're going to end up in resentment and rage. If we're not dealing with those reality issues, we're going to end up with, with the spirituality issue of, of, of really not knowing who we are and we're, we're not going to know um, really where we're going in our life or, or, or um, you know, who we want to be with, etc. And you'll notice certainly we're going to have intimacy issues when it comes to the, our spontaneity and openness. The relational issues then speak for themselves, the either low self-esteem, uh, either low self-esteem less than or low self-esteem better than, enmeshment and abandonment in our relationships regarding boundaries. Dishonesty, I think, is the profound uh, symptom of our codependency and action when it comes to relationships. I just cannot tell you who I am, or if I do, I do it in an offensive and attached uh, fashion. I'll have problems with interdependence and problems with intensity. All those things, I believe, are depression and anxiety in action. And, and so part of that functional adult, adult, functional adult treatment is, is highlighting um, that we uh, need to do more work. Now some of the treatment options here, and I'm going to breeze through some of these. CBT gets a bad name in treatment, but I actually think it's a great way of looking at what happens, what are some of those cognitive distortions, what are some of those negative feeling, st feeling states that we have. Behavioural therapy, uh, as I said, we, I know that it's about tuning into our body and tuning into those sensations. But generally, um, making that 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 changes behavioural sort of connection that I need to get up and uh, you know the, the change some of our diet, change the way we rest, change um, the way that we um, exercise our body, uh, tune into our body, regulate our body through mindfulness and breathing. So those those are behavioural uh, changes that we make, and I, I don't want behavioural therapy to get a bad name because it is uh, it has quite a somatic impact in how we deal with, with, with ourselves. I think that, that uh, there must be, I've always thought for a while now that yogis around the world must be scratching their head thinking why did it take us so long to get on to the, the mindfulness te techniques of breathing and relaxation, all forms of yoga and mindfulness are really getting us, diaphragmic breathing, getting us back in, in, in touch with our body in such a different way that it can have an incredible impact on our, our uh, the way we experience ourselves and especially the symptoms of um, uh, anxiety and depression. The, the idea of, uh, I've got caffeine there, but uh, the mindfulness and moderate exercise essential. We have moderate exercise here. We know that people really would love us to have more of an exercise program, but we, we yoga and, and um, our morning and evening walks uh, are something where we know that uh, we, we it, it, it's good for the endorphins, it's good for those healthy uh, chemicals on the body, uh, good for the, to bring the oxygen up. Caffeine should be linked there with diet, really cutting back on caffeine and sugar um, and, and, and Separating nutrition these days from uh, mental health is is um, is simply uh, impossible with the research that we have. So we hope that when people come into South Pacific, that our daily schedule starts to give them the opportunity to live differently, get better rest, get some mild, moderate exercise, cut down on caffeine and sugar, start the yoga, uh, do the mindfulness to take ten at lunchtime, and the opportunity to tune into the iPad, the um, the eye shuffles, and and uh, borrow the resources and and practice more mindfulness in your your, your life. So when you leave here, you've got that practice. Practice. Um, for you guys even that, uh, that aren't alcoholics, cutting down on alcohol, quitting smoking, um, uh, medication and pharmacotherapy for, for treatment are all things that are going to get um, uh, uh, suggested to you in treatment either here in SPP or when you're out on the outside if you're tuning into this as a resource. So treatment for anxiety and depression can take time. Uh, it, it's, it's not a quick fix. But recovery is not a quick fix, and and I think that um, it it it's it, there is a lot of acceptance that needs to happen in early recovery. Um, one of the things that I I noticed that you'll if you come to our 
healthy lifestyles lecture I, I wanted to just highlight this at the end of treatment because holy if we really look at holistic treatment and our inpatient tr program tries to set that up dr. Dan Siegel took the the concept of the new American um, uh, populations uh, the the Department of Disease came up with this healthy um, meal platter for folks and he thought wow for optimal brain reintegration um, that that some of the things that we have here in on site are, are there to relieve us of some of these secondary symptoms so he talks about and he uses some of their language of making up that full center nutrients and if we engage in these every day they actually strengthen the brain's internal connections and therefore assist us to connect with others in, in people and, and in the world around us so so what we we have is um, and I won't in the lecture that we have with healthy lifestyles here we, we will we'll try and achieve all these things that in our written work and journaling and group sessions we really tune in and focus and that that helps that part of that brain integration Playtime, our weekend program sometimes gets a really bad rap here. We don't do enough and what drumming, what the hell, I never came here for that and charades and karaoke, that's just crazy. But what we know about playtime and connecting with others and then allowing ourselves to sort of be in that, in that in that stage of spontaneity with others can be a real challenge for folks. So they're very deliberate. The, the, even the charades and karaoke aren't like, what the hell can we get people to do uh, on a Saturday night? It's let's get folks into that playfulness and it's, and again, it helps with the way that the brain integrates. And, and so, um, we know that it's difficult for folks with trauma to be just spontaneous, but it's a great opportunity to connect with others and connect with what comes up with us and integrates the brain. The connecting time, morning walks, beach yoga, uh, just tuning, uh, tune, you know, connecting with ourself, uh, connecting with others can be really important and part of our uh, uh, environment. Physical time, the, the, the morning walks, the yoga, balanced exercises about getting, getting into our visca in a healthy way, getting those endorphins moving. Um, time in, mindfulness, soothe, contain, move on, uh, meditation as a way of, of really focusing internally and, um, and on those sensations and images, feelings and you know, thoughts, becoming aware, becoming conscious downtime without any specific goal. Now for some folks that's just uh, lounging in the rock castle room, gazing off to the horizon, um, laying on the bed and doing some meditation, just you know the, the, the tuning out. I, I mentioned the serenity prayer, third step prayer and 11 step prayer. Sleep time, rest, like with you cannot uh, separate any more the symptoms of depression, anxiety from uh, nutrition, hydration or, or the, 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 the rest you know those three things have been changing those patterns and uh, having healthier sleep patterns are really important so we're pretty well near the end of this I know I've gone a bit over time thank you for you folks sticking in with me uh, as I said I jammed a lot into this um, but I suppose some of the tips are that we're healing through the body and the feelings that's been something the PM Melody suggested from the get-go um, that 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 that, that the way back to our trauma is through the body sensations and our feeling realities. That we grow our awareness and then we learn, you know, from that awareness, learn to appropriately meet our needs and wants. Now, we're all in recovery. An appropriate need of an alcoholic is to go to AA and, go, and get into abstinence. Um, an appropriate need of someone that's got that, that limbic system reaction of PTSD is to get, get some support around that and learn to regulate. So we're looking at that holistic change versus just abstinence that we, we need to recover from our history and our symptoms. The Healthy Mind Platter, really uh, Dan Siegel and his resources online are fantastic and, uh, and Dr. Patrick Carnes' 30-point competency plan over time, um, it's, it's, it's a lifestyle change versus that quick fix. So it's always disappointing sometimes we just want to come in and think, can I just change this stuff really quickly? Unfortunately, that's not the case, especially if we've had a, a, an early childhood of trauma and then an adult life where we've really run away and created some of these sort of neural pathways that cause us a lot of stress and damage. It won't be a quick fix, but, but recovery is definitely possible. The Soothe Contain Move On is our own little tool in treatment and Butterfly Hands was just what can we give clients from the moment that they come in to just start to soothe their, their, their own affect. Now this mightn't sound like much when you're in panic, but Dr. Stephen Porger says that the simple um, 
act of mechanically breathing can override the nervous system's reaction. So just the, the, the placing our hands uh, in a way that just braces our body, one over the diaphragm, one over the sort of general central chest region, region just allows us to take those deep diaphragmic breaths that draw more oxygen in. And if we're taking that deep and gentle breathing um, and we start to get a nice rhythm going with that, what you'll notice is it changes the heart rate, it changes the stress chemicals being released. And as long as we're genuinely not not under threat, very quickly uh, we start to feel really differently in our body. Now I won't go over, this is not a soothing and contain move on webinar, we've got, we've certainly got one on our website you can tune into if you're interested in more of this, but the idea then of tuning into our reality, noticing what those defences are, what are those, what are the needs I've got at the moment, what some of those toxic feelings, that's all part of this way of dealing with depression and anxiety through the SPP way I suppose you'd say, that we're not just about trying to uh, psychotherapeutically or psychopharmacotherapy, uh, get you to medicate yourself away from the, the just the symptoms. That might be part of, of what you do when you first come into treatment. But we'll be working with you at these underlying issues. And uh, as I said, if I could wave a magic wand, it would be getting people sharing those realities every day. So when you leave here, you practiced at it. And uh, you'll notice on the right there, it's the, remember, I've got to reparent, it's my job. Uh, no one's coming, that's the, the interesting thing. You might be getting picked up when you leave here, but believe me, they're powerless over you. It's, it's, it's tuning in um, to, to the reality that, that, that the, the, the examined life's no picnic, but to see our drama clearly is to be liberated from it. If I can just start to reparent myself and make decisions that appropriately meet my needs and wants over time, uh, I'm, I'm going to make headway in my recovery. And that will take some acceptance. We talked about today, um, for any of you recovery nerds out there, you might already know this, but in the fourth edition of the Alcoholics Anonymous um, Big Book, page 417 talks about how important acceptance is in recovery, that, that it's not so much praying for a lighter load but a stronger back, life on life's terms. Um, as we're trying to grow into our maturity and recovery, it, life on life's terms can be really tough. So the serenity prayer can be a real mindfulness tool that's, that's practicing radical acceptance. You know, God grant me the serenity, you know, to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And, and, and so, um, you know, these, these particular tools are about addressing the underlying uh, uh, sort of triggers to the depression anxiety that we might feel as a result of this trauma. And, and so this is what makes us different at South Pacific Private than a lot of other places. We, we do want to introduce you to these ideas as well as giving you that support you need about those symptoms. So I suppose I'm feeling some healthy shame. My uh, trusty assistant that's right next to me that no one ever gets to see, Samantha Higgins, has, uh, has been trying to give me hand signals of uh, could you please be quiet. Um, but uh, but um, uh, I suppose there was a lot to it when we talk about depression and anxiety. Um, it, it sometimes is one of the criticisms of coming into treatment. It's like, oh, it's always geared up just for addicts. But uh, you know, Pia Melody makes it really clear in her model and we've had 21 years of experience of working with um, depression and anxiety as a bona fide symptom that fits into this model and that, that if we deal with those, you know, the reason we put addicts and people with depression and anxiety in one primary group is we know that the underlying primary symptoms and the relational issues are very much uh, are what bind us together. That, 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 that what we're powerless over and unmanageable as a result of that powerlessness it can be easily experienced with people with depression and anxiety. Therefore, 12-step fellowships as part of our aftercare, as well as going on to do mindfulness, yoga, light exercise, changing that, that healthy mind platter. But there's plenty of people with depression and anxiety might go to an AA meeting or an Al-Anon meeting or a Codependence Anonymous meeting. Um, we've got Joe Hass's um, The 12 Steps to Happiness in our bookstore. Plenty of people with depression and anxiety incorporate some of those tools as a way of going, oh, well, I admit I'm powerless over my codependency, my depression, my anxiety, and that my life becomes unmanageable when I try and manage it with my adult adapted child with those defense mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. I hope um, this has been 
uh, helpful. I hope that, um, that there's been some information here in regards to the model and depression and anxiety that might promote you more towards aftercare. Um, if there's any uh, questions that folks have, um, please by all means send them in. Uh, we will get back to you after the fact. This particular webinar will be posted up on our YouTube channel and be available. Uh, generally we get that up pretty quick. Sam gets onto that tomorrow. So that'll be available to you. If you are out there at the moment struggling, uh, not feeling, um, you know, having in, in, in relapse even from your symptoms of depression and anxiety, please reach out to us or reach out to your, your, your sort of health practitioners in your area, you know, re-engage back with your therapist. We say in our, in our um, you know, if I think, if I think um, of the sign that we have in our reception, we tell people an extraordinary thing. We ask you to expect a miracle when you come in here. And I think the miracle is, is that if you tune back into yourself and take a risk with others and connect with others, you connect with you first and connect with others, and for some of you, you connect with a higher power as well, then all of a sudden you get you back, you get your life back. And, and that connection to self, that deep connection to self opens you up to being connected to everything. Uh, uh, Pia Melody shared with me this year that she's about to, her next book is, is something she was sort of afraid to highlight earlier on in her career, which is that if you can reconnect with you at that deep level, if our functional adult can re reparent us, that we actually get to a point where we reconnect with, with God as we understand God. We reconnect with our own soul. And that can be the, the that takes me back to that initial slide right at the beginning. If I, if I, didn't get that love when I was authentic, when I was just me, then I got that clear message I'm not going to survive, that I'm not okay, that there's something fundamentally wrong with me. And I like to think when people come back into SPP, it might be their symptoms of depression and anxiety that brought you here, but that we can actually uh, help you slowly work through some of the toxic shame at the very core of that, that you get that message back that, that you are that miracle that we ask you to be mindful of when you leave here. That doesn't mean life's going to be easy. It doesn't mean early recovery is going to be easy. In actual fact, it will probably get worse before it gets better, but that's a fact of recovery. What I think about that is that you don't have to do that journey alone. We're here for you. The recovery community is there for you. So I want to um, sort of just um, thank you for listening and, um, and uh, I'll see you on the recovery road somewhere. Take care.